Hello and welcome to Real Vision Crypto Unwrapped, a new show in which we cut through the noise and hype surrounding digital assets to get you ahead of the curve and bring you key takeaways for investing in crypto, Web3 and beyond. I'm Paul Guerra, Real Vision social media producer, and with me are our crypto editor Ash Bennington and Leslie Lamb, the CMO of CoinFlex and the host of the Crypto Unstacked podcast. Please guys, send us your questions. We want to hear from you. You can do it on realvision.com. YouTube, Twitter, the Real Vision Exchange, or for our Crypto uh, Pro, Pro members, you can get into our Discord channel. Welcome, guys, and please, let's jump in right into the action. Ash, what's going on with price action today? Why is it important, and what's happening with Bitcoin specifically? Yeah, well, the short answer is it's moving sideways at the moment. This is actually interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, the price of Bitcoin over the last few days has been hovering between this $29,000 to $30,000 mark. Uh, correlations are lower. Uh, obviously, this is below that key $30,000 psychological price level in Bitcoin. But I want to take a look and decompose this for a few layers uh, and take a look at the correlations here. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now uh, is a chart uh, that shows the correlation between uh, NASDAQ futures, this is, I believe, NASDAQ 100, uh, and Bitcoin. So effectively, what you see uh, is, is this incredible tight correlation uh, between Bitcoin and NASDAQ 100. What does that mean? Well, what it suggests is that you're seeing everything trading uh, effectively uh, in tandem. It's one trade. Uh, when you go risk on in traditional equity markets, you see risk on in Bitcoin. And conversely, as we see right now, uh, when you see risk off in equity markets, you see risk off in Bitcoin. Uh, obviously, you can see uh, that directionality of the correlation remains intact, but what you're seeing effectively now, over the last couple of days at least, is Bitcoin trading almost like a higher beta asset relative to the underlying benchmark, if you want to call it that, of the NASDAQ 100, Paul. So Ash, what does it mean for all of us? Does it mean, because a couple of days ago, the story was that Bitcoin and especially was finally, you know, being not that correlated to NASDAQ, but you're saying that probably in the long, in the big picture, it is still correlated and that's going to be the case? Yeah. Well, obviously well, it's harder to talk about the future than the past, but what we can say pretty definitively uh, is that that correlation has been incredibly strong. Uh, this is something that we've seen uh, across markets, across asset classes, currencies, commodities, fixed income. You see effectively everything trading uh, relative to what's happening in central bank policy. And I think it's probably important to point out that the idea of Bitcoin being an off the grid store of value that's non-correlated uh, to other traditional asset classes at the current moment, at least, uh, that's not been the case. In fact, it's precisely the opposite. What we see is an incredibly tight correlation between U.S. equities, particularly between between tech stocks like NASDAQ 100, which is represented there, uh, showing this intensely tight correlation. Now, when you see uh, Bitcoin actually underperforming NASDAQ, again, the metaphor here is uh, like a high beta stock. Uh, when you see deterioration in the underlying value of the NASDAQ 100, for example, you see Bitcoin sell off even more, Paul. Okay, Ash, so let's say for retail investors or someone new in crypto, and again, this is not uh, financial advice, we're doing this for uh, educational purposes only, but a, a person entering the crypto space right now, a fresh new person, would they think it's a really volatile asset? Is it very risky? How do you see it for someone entering for the first time into crypto? Well, first of all, in terms of personal financial advice, we don't do that. This is not financial advice. I wouldn't touch that question with a 10-foot barge pole. Uh, but look, when you talk about the volatility of this asset class, we have historical data. So uh, we can show a chart. I think we have it of uh, this is percent drawdown from peak, sometimes called max drawdown. What you see uh, is Bitcoin is an extraordinarily volatile asset. Uh, mm -hmm. This shows essentially if you would bought at the top of the market or a previous high what did you stand to lose <clears throat> at the max drawdown, meaning at the lowest point in price? <clears throat> Excuse me. And what you can see on this chart, when you go back to 2012, it was over 90%. So when investors put uh, a dollar into Bitcoin at uh, trough, meaning at bottom, at worst, uh, they lost 90 cents on the dollar. Now, what you can see is those troughs are actually rising a bit. That's a good sign. It means that the max drawdown uh, is, getting, uh, is getting closer uh, to flat. But... Look, right now we're over 56 down percent down from peak. This is really painful. People who invested at the last high lost 56 cents on the dollar. 
all of these digital assets that we talk about that I'm so passionate about that I really believe represent the future of finance, uh, the future of the way we're going to interact uh, in commerce, in trust, in all kinds of different ways. It's really important for people to understand these are incredibly volatile, highly speculative plays. Uh, make no mistake about that. A hundred percent, Ash. And there's something that we would like to talk about, and it's the, the other side of the story regarding Bitcoin, which is the Bitcoin dominance. It's hit it's historic uh, percentages at this point is at 44.7, the Bitcoin dominance and the total market cap of the cryptocurrency global market cap. So can you please elaborate a little on that and what's happening with Bitcoin and Bitcoin dominance specifically? Yeah, so, so Bitcoin dominance is the relative percentage of the total crypto market cap uh, that is represented by Bitcoin. In other words, what percent of the value uh, across crypto is held in Bitcoin? Uh, as you said, that's up to about 45%. You can see that little uptick on the chart. Uh, look, I think it's important to note that the reason that we see Bitcoin rising as the price of Bitcoin has declined, it means everything else in the asset class has performed much worse. So Bitcoin, as the price deteriorates uh, on the altcoins, so-called, you see the, the total percentage represented by Bitcoin rising. Yeah. Yes, and we have to thank yeah, so, Fred. Yes. Sorry, Leslie, you were going to say something. Yeah, no worries. So I was just going to add, you know, I wonder whether uh, large investors, right, whale-like investors are really adding to the narrative here where they're looking at this market correction for Bitcoin as a buying opportunity, right? The so-called buying the dip and really accumulating more Bitcoin in their wallets and, sets. right, and adding to that uh, that metric there of long-term Bitcoin holders. Um, we're seeing nation states buying the dip. And that is an indicator for the average retail investor that, look, relative to a lot of the other cryptos out there, um, Bitcoin as a brand has existed now for nearly a decade, right? So uh, it is a testament to really the validity of Bitcoin as one of the mainstays in crypto. Um, and I would see that contributing, right, to the overall narrative um, that Bitcoin is here to stay. And that's why we're seeing the numbers that we're seeing right now. That's right, Leslie. And I, I would like to actually thank Fred K, which was uh, a user that saw the show last week and proposed this topic. So thank you. And you can leave your questions uh, on YouTube, Twitter and everywhere else. Ash, a new, a new question regarding this, what Leslie said, actually, Bitcoin is here to stay. That's clear. There's no doubt about that. And actually, we have a new record of people hodling or holding the tokens for more than a year. It reached an all time high on wallets. So do you have any more insights about that? Well, we think Bitcoin is here to stay. I don't know that there's no doubt about it. Uh, it certainly seems as though Bitcoin has obviously a much more durable track record uh, than any of the other digital assets. Look, buying the dip is no guarantee that you're buying at a lower price. You know, uh, the, this one trade idea means that there's sort of two by and large regimes that uh, investors seem to be taking, buy the dip and sell the rip. Whether or not we are in a sell the rip phase uh, is something that very much, uh, I think, remains to be seen. I think it's a positive sign, you could say, certainly, uh, that there are long-term hodlers out there who are holding Bitcoin. Uh, but again, no guarantee of future performance here or anywhere else across risk assets, definitionally. So, basically... Yeah, based based on that, let's actually go to um, you know a clip of the day here where we are seeing Ben Cowan, the CEO of Into the Cryptoverse, um, who spoke with Ash uh, about this exact point of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin correction, where the price is headed, right? Where do we go from here? So let's take a look at this clip. My suspicion is that there's going to be more juice in the jar than people have thought in the notion that, OK, this is all over bottom pick. It's likely to be too soon. There is in most instances that people want to do uh, bottom pick picking because you've stopped going down. You usually get a real final leg of pain. Ash, give us your takeaways from this conversation. What were some of the um, lessons that you learned from his insights? Well, first, let me apologize. I hear some sirens outside. This is New York City. We're doing the show live. Uh, so you probably hear those police sirens in the background. Look, Ben Cowan is an absolutely fascinating uh, guy. Uh, so I think what's so interesting about Ben is that he looks at these uh, markets, digital asset markets, crypto markets across three different axes. First, he does traditional uh, 
price uh, t technical analysis, which I think uh, obviously many of our viewers are familiar with. Second, uh, he does on-chain analytics analysis. On-chain analytics are incredibly interesting. These are the rich data trails that come off the protocols themselves, and he analyzes those protocols uh, to understand what precisely is happening uh, in markets or to try and get a handle on that, uh, to basically see things like usage levels, things that are happening with wallet addresses, uh, percentage uh, of hodlers, all of those types of data analytics uh, are what Ben looks at. Finally, he looks at social analytics. This is really interesting. He basically has these platforms where he pulls in data from Twitter, from Facebook, from Reddit to try and analyze the amount of interest in the space. Uh, all told, I think it's fair to say, uh, based on Cowan's analysis, based on the clip we just heard, it's pretty bearish right now, Leslie. Sorry, guys, I have a question right now that popped in on YouTube by Jose Navarro. And the question is, do you see the correlation change in a situation like hyperinflation? You know, I think that's an interesting question. It remains to be seen. We haven't had hyperinflation in the United States since the 1970s. Um, look, we don't know is the short answer. That's the hope. That's the dream. That's what people in the Bitcoin space uh, have been talking about, this off-the-grid store of value function. Uh, it hasn't yet been tested. So far, in fact, what we've seen is the correlation move in opposite directions. Excuse me, the, the correlation, I should say, the correlation moving in the same direction, which is the opposite of what people in the Bitcoin space uh, have been suggesting, just to clarify. So there's a question of whether stable coins then have a role in countries where um, hyperinflation is affecting uh, people's ability to buy things, right? Their, their income, their purchasing power. Um, and when we talk about utility, practicality of crypto, uh, stable coins really have a started to fill that gap, uh, not you know fully, but uh, we are hearing stories of people who are putting their local currencies into a US dollar stable coin um, and using that as a so-called store of value uh, because you know that really is the narrative. Yeah, I guess a cynic might say uh, the same could be true of just holding US dollars. Uh, so really, do you need the stable coin for the store of value function if you live in a country where there's hyperinflation? I guess the answer is if you don't have access to US dollars, it might be helpful. That said, you can say if you look at, for example, uh, Bitcoin pegged against the uh, Argentine currency, uh, obviously it's performed extremely well. So people uh, in those uh, developing uh, countries have seen outperformance on Bitcoin relative to people who have held it against dollars, for example. True. I have friends in Venezuela and Argentina, some different places in Latin America, and with those hyperinflationary economies, people tend to go more towards some stable coin. And speaking about stable coins and what's going on uh, lately, we can't uh, not talk about what's going on with Terra and the Luna situation, right? So we all know what happened, the meltdown of this one, it was a top 10 coin and uh, Luna and UST basically imploded. So the latest on this is that as of a few hours ago, a couple of hours ago, uh, the Terra uh, Labs Twitter account finally confirmed that on the proposal 1623, which was the rebirth of a new blockchain, let's say the genesis, the creation of a new blockchain, the Terra 2.0 will be created. It was approved by the community. It had some hiccups here and there. They had to amend it because originally the community didn't agree to. And they had other intentions. Mostly they want to burn tokens, even though Do Kwon said that it's not going to help in any sort of way. But the story here is that now in South Korea specifically, we are seeing that the regulators and some authorities are actually trying to find the responsibility of the top five major exchanges in Korea regarding the trading fees and selling and, and, and buying the fees trading of Luna and UST. So they might want to make them accountable for what happened here. And also we have the Financial Times calling Do Kwon the most hated person in Korea. And we all heard about the story about this person who lost reportedly $2.3 million dollars and he broke into Do Kwon's apartment, which of course it's not okay to just mix and, and thread the family of, of Do Kwon. So this is something that happened and it's a lot of thing going on. You, you have the Mopa bridge in, in Seoul, which is a high place where people is very known for suicides. It actually, there's some correlation 
that at the time of the meltdown of Luna, the online searches for this bridge went really high and were climbing. So authorities and the police had to go to the bridge and monitor it because people were getting depressed. It is reported that more than 40,000 billion tokens of Luna were held by Korean retail investors. So this is a story that has affected a lot of people. And uh, I would like to say, including me, uh, I, 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 this is the first time I, I talk about this, but personally, I lost. Uh, a big chunk of my life savings into UST. So I've been feeling, of course, emotionally sad for a few days and I'm getting over it. But it is really hard as a retail investor when you trust it's something that was supposed to be stable and you see it going away. So that's something regarding with Luna and Turin, the latest uh, happenings into this story. Yeah, and when we talk about stable coins as well, you know, Tether obviously is the largest stable coin out there. Um, we have been hearing news, of course, of the circulating supply of Tether dropping by a billion dollars. And look, it might be a signal uh, that asset flow is going to more trusted and transparent stable coins. Uh, Coinflex, uh, which is a fellow issuer of stable coins, really holds the view that, you know, now it's more important than ever to be pushing forward uh, transparency around stable coins, you know, the composition and the sufficiency of the collateral uh, and, and the associated risks, right, of dealing with them. Um, and so the the talk about Tether has has kind of been, well, Tether has depegged. Sure, it's depegged multiple times. Uh, mm -hmm. But the argument here is whether you know, these temporary DPEGs uh, equates to Tether breaking the peg, which is what we saw with UST, right? Uh, that was a permanent break. Um, and so when we look at, you know, news about uh, the the Tether uh, spokespeople, they're coming out and trying to defend Tether. Um, one of the things that they mentioned is that uh, from this past incident, right, there was more demand for liquidity of Tether uh, than than actually existed on exchange order books. And that was really the impetus uh, for the temporary depegging. Um, but the big picture here is that Tether really still is a mainstay and remains the number one stable coin. Uh, it remains the lifeblood of a lot of the trading and lending activity in crypto. And really the fact that Tether has uh, been able to redeem $10 billion worth uh, you know, of 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 crypto, um, and largely withstood this past market stress is notable, right? If Tether were to come down, uh, that would have major, major implications uh, for really all of the crypto finance activity that's happening right now. But if we zoom out from Tether uh, and we look at stablecoin regulation, right, amidst all of this activity uh, and 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 uh, you know market stress, um, really. What's interesting is that we are seeing more regulators uh, and, and representatives from Congress working together to figure out what does the long term uh, you know, view hold for stablecoin regulation. So there is one uh, that that uh, just came out, a crypto bill. It's a bipartisan effort that was led by Senator Cynthia Loomis. Uh, she's been a longtime Bitcoin adv advocate, uh, which is apparent on crypto Twitter. And uh, this bill basically would help to differentiate uh, crypto securities and uh, commodities. And in a speech last week, Luma suggested that this bill would put stable coins such as Tether uh, and UST in the securities category. Uh, but the broader question is, you know, what agency will have oversight of what cryptocurrencies? What will the SEC have oversight of? What will the CFTC have oversight of? Um, you know, and so being able to discern and separate the roles of these two regulatory watchdogs um, yeah. is one of the main goals of this bill. And Loomis even said um, this past Tuesday at the DC, you know, blockchain summit, uh, where Real Vision uh, was was also a part of as well, um, that the CFTC would go on to become, you know, a primary regulator uh, for crypto, and apparently they they already are. Um, you know, one of their recent CFTC commissioners, uh, Caroline uh, Pham, mentioned that they already have a framework that's ready made to go right now uh, into the regulated sector for digital assets uh, and that the SEC would instead look after the coins that are defined by the Howey test as uh, security. 
So mm-hmm. basically, you know, the bill, if it's successful, um, we would, you know, see greater regulatory clarity in the U.S. Uh, for the crypto industry. And this is extremely helpful, again, for the growth of crypto businesses uh, in the states. Uh, and so this uh, bill is expected to uh, get votes um, by next year at the latest. Um, and yeah, it really does have implications for uh, how people view and use not only stable coins, but also crypto. Paul, back to you. Yes, and something that I forgot to mention regarding the stable coins, regarding Do Kwon, is also that in Korea, he's facing right now criminal charges and there are some lawsuits happening. So we'll uh, keep an eye on that and keep reporting for the next week. But right yeah. now, Leslie and Ash, we do have a question that uh, came from Jackson Stock on YouTube. And it says, if Bitcoin has a limited supply and people are huddling, then what is to stop a large amount of the supply concentrating and a small number of accounts and never be moving? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. That's the short answer. There's nothing. There's nothing to stop it. Okay, can I just jump in also and say, I think Leslie did a great job describing what was happening in stable coins. Um, look, the, the reality is, and, and I think we should call them so-called stable coins, particularly <laughs> when we're talking about algorithmic stable coins, uh, okay. because whether or not they prove to be stable, that's the marketing term. Um, you know, but the reality is it, it's kind of like if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. If something begins <laughs> to look like a traditional regulated activity, a regulated financial services banking activity, we have a whole framework of laws in this country beginning in the 1930s uh, that describe how those are supposed to be monitored and regulated. Uh, so I think with with stable coins, uh, that's something that is uh, people who are in the space. I know I've been saying it for some time. It's like, highly likely that we're going to get more regulation around stable coins. If you want to be old fashioned about it, you could divide stable coins into two different categories. Those that are fully backed by U.S. dollars and audited and those that are not. The reality is Tether, which uh, Leslie spoke to very eloquently, uh, has faced calls for full audit. Uh, they claim to be, uh, and I don't mean claim, they assert that they are uh, that they are fully backed by U.S. dollars, but the reality is they have not yet uh, been fully audited. So there are some open questions uh, around exactly that, Paul. Yeah, that's the eternal question with Tether Ash, and we also have the Paxos Gold that's supposedly backed by gold. So we have a huge spectrum of stable coins, and I'm sure that's a topic that we'll have a long time to keep discussing in this show. And with these things happening with USD, I'm sure new regulation will come with leading cases. So something's going to be moving, and we'll keep an eye on that. But now we have to jump to the next section of this show, which is what we don't have to time with what we don't have time to talk about, but still we need you to know. So the first one I would like to start and share is the yesterday was reported by BuzzFeed that Seth, Seth Green's board ape NFT and a doodle and three other ones were stolen. He got fished. So basically they stole his NFTs from his wallet. And the problem is that he had the IP rights over that NFT over the board ape. And he was producing a whole show surrounding his NFT with his production company, the stupid company here in Burbank is a studio. He actually worked with uh, uh, Steve Aoki uh, last year to help him to release his NFT collection. So what's important? Why do you need to know this? Because again, this is something that might end in court. And if it goes to the trial, a trial in court, IP regulation, a leading case, a precedent might be set. And there are three other lawsuits against OpenSea from board ape holders that got their tokens and their NFTs stolen. So that's what we what we need to know about this and what's yours ash d5 vulnerabilities 97 percent of the 1.68 billion dollars in crypto stolen so far in 22 only may uh, is in the d5 space uh, decentralized finance this is according to data from chain analysis wish we had more time to talk about this one today and my story is at Davos, we're hearing markedly different tones uh, on crypto coming from the IMF managing director and the ECB president, who was previously the IMF uh, managing director. Uh, the European Central Bank president, Christine Lagarde, uh, is saying that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are, quote, worth nothing. Uh, it's no surprise. She has been a longtime skeptic here. Uh, and the IMF's uh, Giergiva urges, um, you know, us to actually think about crypto in another light, uh, in light of the terror crash, that we shouldn't 
abandon crypto, but instead really take uh, the view of, you know, regulation to properly manage the crypto space uh, in light of what's happened. So two different tones here. Very interesting to see, um, you know, how how these two uh, different people, uh, you know, continue the conversation about crypto. That's right, Leslie, and especially also after what happened with El Salvador, the IMF has been really, really publicly open against crypto. So that's something we'll definitely keep an eye on. And well, guys, that's it for today's and for this week's show. Thank you for joining us on the second edition of the Real Vision Crypto Unwrapped. Subscribe for free to Real Vision Crypto for more analysis and to our pro crypto subscribers. You have the Crypto Insider Talks to look forward to today. Thank you and we'll see you next week. It's a really complicated world out there. We've got massive inflation, recession fears, war in Europe, COVID, China issues. What the hell's happening? Everyone's got an opinion, but who's right, who's wrong? As co-founder of Real Vision, I've got my own view, but maybe I'm wrong too. And I wanna go and find out more from real experts, real in-depth analysis, and I've hand chosen my experts for this two-week journey of discovery in global recession, is everyone wrong? I've chosen people like Peter Zihan to talk to him about geopolitics, David Rosenberg about the economy, and Pierre Andran, the world's most famous energy trader, about how to navigate the oil markets and where it's all going. This starts on May the 2nd, and I'm gonna learn so much about what really is going on and how to best navigate it. Yes, not everybody's gonna be saying the same thing, but it's gonna allow me to piece together an investment framework to navigate these complicated times. Now, normally we would give you seven day trial for $1, but because this is so important for all of you, and I think it's one of the most important pieces of content we've ever done, we're extending that free trial for two weeks for $1. So you get the entire campaign of all of these great minds, and it's only $1 for all of this. So just go to realvision.com forward slash global recession to find out more and join me as I try and figure out what the hell's going on.